Today's lecture is going to be about photography. Now, photography is unlike any other medium we've studied or are going to study in this class simply because it has a birthday. We can say that photography began on August 19th, 1839, and this is one of the few dates that you need to know for this course. It's on this day that Louis-Jacques Mondeguerre stands in front of a joint meeting of the Academy of Arts and the Academy of Sciences in France and explains to them what photography is. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about that story later. Before, we need to take a look at the precursors to the camera. This would include the silhouette machine, which date back, dates back to the 18th century, where you would have a model sitting in a chair, light source on one side of them, and as the artist, you would be behind this tracing paper, tracing their silhouette. Later on, it would be filled in with black ink or even black construction paper. And these silhouettes would hang in a house very much like a portrait does today over the fireplace or down the hall. And silhouettes were popular all the way through the Victorian age in the late 1800s. And even today, you can go to Disneyland and get your silhouette taken on one of the shops on Main Street. Prior to the silhouette machine, there was the camera obscura, which in Latin, the name translates into darkroom. And this is an invention of the Renaissance. It's invented way back in the 1400s. And originally, this would have been a room-sized chamber that an artist would stand in the center of. It would be placed out in the landscape, and you would have a small pinhole or aperture on one of the walls that would transmit an image of light from the outside world inverted onto the inside tracing paper, and as the artist, you would then trace the image. Now, over time, the camera obscura becomes smaller, more portable, fitted with true lenses and mirrors so that the image would be easier for the artist to draw. But the problem remained that the image still had to be traced. Now, when we get to the exam, you're going to have one or both of these questions. Questions like who invents photography? And it's going to be a completely different answer than who gets credit for inventing photography. When we look at the first question, who invents photography? The answer is lots of people. People like Nisiphor Niepce, who gives us heliography. Or William Henry Fox Talbot, who gives us photogenic drawing. Hippolyte Bayard, Sir John Herschel, all of these individuals help us to create photography the way we know it today. And even Louis-Jacques Mondeguerre also helps in this process. However, when we get down to the question of who gets credit for inventing photography, the answer is Daguerre. And I'll tell you his story momentarily. When we look at early photography, the first type of photography is called heliography. And this is invented by Nisiphor Niepce. This guy was fairly wealthy, and what he did is he had a camera obscura and was doing experiments on how to fix the image, how to make it permanent. And so what he did is he took a plate made out of pewter covered it with bitumen of Judea, which is an asphalt compound, and slid it into the camera obscura. The exposure time on this image was eight hours. And when he took the pewter plate out of the camera obscura, rinsed it with salt water, held it upside down over heated iodine, we have a latent image. And in 1826, 13 years before the invention of photography, we actually have our first photograph. And this is what that scene looks like. It is a chicken coop on this gentleman's estate. Now, when we fast forward to 1830, that's when Nisiphor Niepce and Daguerre meet. Daguerre is a painter of dioramas, of theater sets, and the two of them meet they become friends and they start to collaborate 
on Niepce's process of heliography. And Daguerre does make some suggestions. He suggests instead of using that pewter plate, let's use a plate of highly polished silver for the reflectivity. Instead of using heated iodine and having iodine vapors bring out that latent image, let's use mercury vapor. Now, both of these suggestions work really well, but what no one could have foreseen was that Niepce was going to die suddenly in 1833, and this left Daguerre with all of Niepce's research for this new photographic process. And so this is why Daguerre gets to take that research and gets to present it to the Academy of Arts and the Academy of Sciences on August 19th, 1839, and the French government absolutely loves this. They're going to give Daguerre a pension for the rest of his life. He gets to name the new photographic process after himself, the daguerreotype, and he becomes this semi-celebrity throughout France. And here's an example of a daguerreotype taken by Daguerre. Taking a daguerreotype image is a very intensive process. Today, we're so used to just snapping a picture in the digital age or using something like a Polaroid where it's just one step. All you have to do is press a button. However, back in the day during the daguerreotype age, it was a huge process. All of this equipment here was needed just to prepare the plate. Here's the camera that you would need to take the exposure, the developing equipment. You also need to do some hand coloring because especially the eyes. Now what's happened between heliography and daguerreotypes in terms of exposure is we've gone from eight hours to capture an image down to about a minute. However, during that minute, you're still going to be blinking. And so what would happen on these images is the eyes would not come out. It would almost look like they were hollow or like kind of like a zombie type of image. So they would be painted in later. And then we'd want to protect, preserve, and present these images. Now, this is where I'd like you to stop this video and down in the links below, you're going to have a link for how daguerreotypes are made, and I'd like you to watch that video and then come back to our presentation. So what photography does is it dramatically changes art. Art has been basically on one path its entire time since the Renaissance. So for about 400 years, art has followed along this very graduated pathway and all of a sudden, photography makes it change gears. It eliminates the second role of the artist that we talked about, which is to record the world. No longer do we need a painter to document the world around us. We can do so through photography. It's going to be cheaper, it's going to be easier, and it's going to be more accurate. The modernist writer Charles Baudelaire said, quote, I believe that art is and can be the exact reproduction of nature. An avenging God has heard the prayers of the multitude. Daguerre was his Messiah. And it's true, photography, once it was invented, became this mania that spread throughout Europe and also America. Everyone wanted their photo taken. And this is what a daguerreotype studio would look like. And you'd want to pay particular attention to those head clamps behind the chair. And that was shown in the video that we watched earlier on how daguerreotypes are made. You'd have to sit still for a minute. And by the time we get to the end of 1839, it's down to about 20 or 30 seconds. We're continually working on streamlining photography. And all these people are involved with the exception of Daguerre. Daguerre does not do anything once photography is invented. He kind of like goes off into the sunset as this pseudo celebrity of the early 1800s. While everyone else that we had mentioned earlier, people like Bayard, Herschel, 
Fox Talbot, all of those individuals continue to work on streamlining photography. Now, these individuals here, these children, didn't need to wear a head clamp, mainly because they are all deceased. And in the 1800s, child mortality is a huge issue, and all of these individuals died of tuberculosis. While we think of these as very morbid images today, back in the day, these would have been very loving, comforting images of a family member that has passed away. This is also one of the most collectible and expensive types of photographs you can get from this age. Some of these can run you as much as $10,000. And the only subject matter that is more sought after is animals. I also have another video in the links below that shows you this postmortem photography collection. Now, with as wonderful as photography is, there are some disadvantages we need to be aware of. First of all, these are direct positive prints, meaning that there's no way to reproduce these. These are going to be unique images on a surface of metal. Another drawback is still the exposure times. Now, with heliography, we were at eight hours of exposure. Once daguerreotypes come around, we're down to about 30 to 20 seconds but that is still such a long time to stand still, we get images like this. This street is as busy as this street in this painting. There are people, carriages, horses, but because everyone is in motion, no one is captured, except for the person standing on the street corner in the lower left-hand portion of the image. He stopped long enough to have his shoes shined. The last disadvantage is that we're using mercury vapor in the development process, and that is something that is very poisonous. A professionally made daguerreotype is gonna cost one to two pounds in London during the 1830s and 40s. So that's about a month's salary for the common person. In the United States, a daguerreotype made at the local studio would cost between $250 and $5, an equivalent of $71 to $142 today. There were some famous studios, such as Southworth and Hawes, that would charge as much as $30 for a photo. And this is where this image comes from, is from the studio of Southworth and Hawes. And what they would do is they would find these celebrities to sit for them, in the case of Harriet Beecher Stowe, she was a famous writer of the 1800s, wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, and she would be commissioned basically to sit for this studio. They would take her picture on what's called a full plate daguerreotype, which is about the size of a sheet of paper. Normally, daguerreotypes are a little bit larger than a business card is. And they would actually take two exposures. One they would give to her, and the other exposure they would take and put in their storefront window. So it's kind of like going to maybe a famous deli in Los Angeles or New York, and you'd have these famous people's images on the wall and usually sign photographs of them, letting you know that, hey, I eat here, you should eat here too. The same thing happened with photography. If Southworth and Hawes had that celebrity clientele, you would be more apt to want your photograph taken by them. Up in England, we had the invention of photogenic drawing. Now, this is by William Henry Fox Talbot. And what the process is, is that you'd have sheets of paper soaked in silver chloride, set out in the sun, and usually a plant sample on top of that, and then that would be pressed down by a sheet of glass. In about 15 minutes with sun exposure, you would have the image transfer from positive to negative and from negative to positive. And what Fox Talbot doesn't know at this time is that he has invented the negative, the basis for modern photography. And also with this image, it's done on paper. So we have 
again, the basis of modern photography in photogenic drawing. And a lot of these early photograms, as they were called, are of plant samples. Now, when photography is invented, it's kind of like how the internet was invented. We don't know what to do with it, and we're just uncovering all the different uses. So I've broken this lecture down into topics, such as entertainment, science, documentation, politics, social reform, feminism, and then art for its pure aesthetic value. So we'll look at photography as entertainment first. And back in the 1850s, one of the coolest things to have would be like a stereoscope and stereo cards. This is very much like our modern day Viewmaster, if you had one of those as a kid, where you'd look through this viewfinder and you'd see two images. And when we look through there, they're superimposed as one and it gives a more three dimensional feel to the scene. This is also, these photos are taken at a slight angle. They're about a 3% difference, even though they look exactly the same. And this is a stereoscope camera. And these were really cool. They were traded. They're still inexpensive today because so many of them were produced. You can probably pick these up at an antique store for about $2 each, unless they're on a rare subject matter or they're hand painted, then they'll probably be between 12 and 25 each. But for the most part, they're two bucks. They're really cool to have as something from the 1800s. And these scenes are something that you would not see on a normal basis. For instance, the 1851 World's Fair in London or Confederate soldiers in America the new mode of transportation, the railway car. We also have carte de visites where you would go to a photographer's studio and you could rent clothes to dress in. You could also choose the scene that you would be pictured in. These were highly collectible. And what you would do is once you would have this image taken, you would cut these up into the eight images and you would paste them on the back of your calling card and you could be presented in a way that would make you look a lot better off than you really were. And again, these are highly collectible today, whereas the stereo cards, they're pretty inexpensive. The carte de visites are very, very rare. When we look at photography of science, I placed in here a chrono photograph, which literally translates to a photograph of time. And during the late 1800s, this was a really intensive study of the body's locomotion. Even uh, a book was written it's called Movement by Etienne Jules Marie. What's exciting about these chrono photographs is this idea is what the Luminaire brothers grab onto to begin motion pictures. We also have photography in terms of astronomy and medical uses. And when we think about it, the x-ray is nothing more than a photograph. Moving on to photography as documentation, this is probably the most vast of all the topics that we have. And it's not to say that these images are exclusive to this topic. They can be placed in others as well. But early photojournalism failed. With the burning of the Oswego Mills, we don't get to see the people rushing around trying to put the fire out, and we don't get to see really a great image of the flames devouring these buildings. The exposure time was still too long for this. But for the first time, cameras become standard equipment that people going on expeditions would carry with them. All of a sudden, we would see far off places that we had only read about. For instance, the ruins of ancient Egypt or Greece and Rome. The very first war to be photographed was the Crimean War. But again, we're looking at only images of before the battle would begin 
for its aftermath. And what a different take photography would be on death. When we look at Civil War photos at the left here, we have all these people, uh, a very raw indication of death compared to more of a romantic type sense with the painting at the right, which shows the 1830 Paris Revolution. But we get to see buildings being built, the meeting of the Transcontinental Railroad, the building of the Golden Gate Bridge, our last image of the Titanic, Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. And one of the most famous images we have in America is of Migrant Mother by the photographer Dorothea Lange. Dorothea Lange is charged with humanizing the Great Depression. And this photo taken in 1936 shows this poor agricultural family uh, on the brink of starvation. And what we don't see, though, is the earlier photos. Dorothea Lange says that she was driving in this remote area and she pulls over to the side of the road because she sees this tent and there's a car off to the right that is up on blocks, the tires are gone. She says in this interview, which took place in 1960, that she remembers this photo as she says, I approached the hungry and desperate mother as if attracted like a magnet. And I took five photos before we even talked, moving closer and closer with each exposure. And it was only after I had taken the last one, that famous image, where the two talked. And the woman told her her age, which was 33. And so also that car up on blocks, the tires had been sold to provide food for her family because they had been surviving on vegetables from the surrounding fields that had been frozen and also uh, any birds that the children could have killed. When we look at photography as politics, I chose this image of Abraham Lincoln. And at this stage, he is a senator from Illinois, and he is running for president. However, there are rumors about that he is ugly and malformed, and those rumors do happen to be true. What he ends up doing is he heads over to Matthew Brady's photography studio and the photographer does some tricks with the lower camera angle, makes the future president turn his attenuated fingers underneath to hide them, shines a bright light as well in his face. And this image is what gets published in the newspapers. And of course, we know that he becomes our 16th president. And I forget the disease that Lincoln had, but you can definitely see here that he is taller than everyone else by at least a foot, and he is still our tallest president we've ever had. At lectures and talks, Lincoln would even credit Matthew Brady with making him president. Matthew Brady, of course, is going to go on to fame as a Civil War photographer. You'll see a lot of his images in the Ken Burns special, but he photographed not only the North, but also the South. Images of famous people like Custer, celebrities such as Mark Twain. And I believe Matthew Brady ends up photographing eight sitting presidents. This image is from a private family collection. My friend's grandfather is the individual at the left there. And this is taken behind the scenes at the graduation for Columbia University, where my friend's grandfather had attended. And so he was a presidential advisor to both Kennedy and Johnson, and he got Kennedy to speak at the graduation ceremony. Unfortunately, we also have the horrible incidents in Dallas in 1963. And we're going to move on to photography as social reform. One of the most famous books of photographs is called How the Other Half Lives by Jacob Rees, who was a police reporter working in the Lower East Side of Manhattan, which would be known as the slums. This book is first published in 1892. It is still in print today. You can 
get it from Amazon or Barnes and Noble or any of the local bookshops. Um, what 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 Jacob Rees would do is he would go out in the middle of the night and take pictures of the living conditions of the poor. A lot of these photos might look like they're overexposed near the top. Um, however, that is just the flash powder that was used. These individuals here living in a morgue. And of course, the tenement housing. We do have to be aware of truthfulness in photography. It can definitely be the most truthful medium, but it can also be not truthful. Jacob Rees told these kids to pretend that they were asleep to take this image. Besides Jacob Rees, we also need to be aware of Lewis Hine. And today he's famous for these worker images of workers on the Empire State Building and other skyscrapers in New York, very iconic images of Americana. But earlier than this, he was charged with But earlier than this, he was concerned with problems such as child labor. He wanted to prevent things like this from happening. He was the chief investigator and photography. He was the chief investigator and photographer for the National Committee on Child Labor. In 1907, government inquiry revealed that at least one and three quarter million children between the ages of 10 and 15 were working in U.S. factories. In cotton mills, almost 50% of the workers were an average of 10 years old. And this is barely 100 years ago. Children as young as four years old labored in a variety of trades for up to 12 hours a day. And so while today we look at Heinz images as very iconic, for the early part of the 20th century. It does not show children actively being abused, but these are young children working in dangerous conditions for very little pay and working for very long hours. The result of Lewis Hines' imagery here and his connection to the National Committee on Child Labor is child labor laws. So you do have to associate that with these images. In photography as feminism, we definitely have to talk about Cindy Sherman. Not only is she the photographer of this work, she's also the person inside the photograph. She rose to fame in the late 1970s with this untitled film still series, where she portrayed how women were shown in the media, whether it's in movies, television, or advertising, the woman playing the role of the victim. These photographs are heavily produced. We have makeup, lighting, costume, script, everything is involved with this photograph. It's not like a quick selfie set out in the city. Here, Cindy Sherman is playing the country girl that comes to the city to find work. But she can take on a myriad of disguises, whether it's a secretary or a housewife And as this film series continues on, and the numbers are not sequential, they do jump around and there are gaps in between the numbers. The photographs grow in size. They start off by a simple eight by 10 photo. By the time we're finished, uh, a photo like this is over three feet tall. And they do transition from black and white into color. But what's amazing about Cindy Sherman is she gets more for her photographs at auction than anyone else does by a long shot. Her photographs sell for close to $4 million. And the person behind her, Diane Arbus, gets about half a million dollars for her photographs. And this is from a later series that Cindy Sherman does. 
Our final topic is photography as art or the aesthetic value. And here we have people like Timothy O'Sullivan, who was a Civil War photographer under Matthew Brady. This guy would run out during the most horrendous battles and take photographs. Twice he had his camera shot out from his hands. And then he would run into his mobile van there and develop his images on the battle site. But after the war was over, he joined the U.S. Geological Survey crew with people like Ansel Adams, and they would photograph the beautiful western regions of our country, from Colorado on up to Idaho and down into New Mexico. We can also talk about Diane Arbus here and her most famous photograph of the boy with the toy hand grenade. And of course, this is a really disturbing image of this boy in Central Park. His eyes are bugged out. His hair is messy. The strap of his overalls is falling off of his shoulder. Not only does he have a grenade in one hand, his other hand is perched like a talons of a bird. But what's unique about Diane Arbus is she took a full dozen images of this boy on a Saturday morning and in 11 of those images, he's this happy, playful little kid, but the one that she chose was the one that was the most disturbing. So she's earned the nickname, the photographer of freaks, and she poses people that are really considered maybe on the outskirts of the social norms. She loves to play with juxtaposition, but she photographs people like circus performers, and here is a dance at a retirement home. Giants. And of course, one of her most famous images, the identical twins, which were the basis for the twins that we see in the movie, The Shining. And they're really happy little girls. Among my favorite photographers is Sally Mann. And she uses a wet plate collodion camera from the 1850s to take her photographs with. And that's what she's posed by in this image. There is a video link below that I'd like you to check out about her and her life. She lives up on a ranch. It's a family ranch. And her early photographs are of landscape. But her most notable her most famous are of her children. And she does place them many times in very adult situations. And some of her images have even got her into a little bit of controversy. We do need to touch on three photographic publications that you need to know about. The first one is The Pencil of Nature, and this is by William Henry Fox Talbot. William Henry Fox Talbot was the one who gave us, early in the lecture, photogenic drawing. He also published the very first book of photographs in 1844. And in this book, we have the different uses of photography, such as keeping an inventory of a person's china collection. And so you would generally have a photograph followed by several pages of writing. And what's important here is that this is one of the images from the book. This is called The Open Door, and it's based on a famous Dutch painting from the 1600s. So we have from an early time, from the genesis of photography, the idea that this medium can be used for artistic value. We already mentioned How the Other Half Lives by Jacob Rees, first published in 1892. The topic is social reform. And our last image is Life Magazine. This is the outlet that American photographers had and utilized for over 30 years. People like Dorothea Lang, Emma Jean Cunningham, Minor White, all of these famous American photographers would have been shown here. And this is going to end our lecture on photography.